volume two chapter twenty five of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park this librivox recording is in the public domain the jalonka wilderness a warlike tale we continued at kinita koru until noon of the twenty second of april when we removed to a village about seven miles to the westward the inhabitants of which being apprehensive of hostilities from the fulas of fuladu were at this time employed in constructing small temporary huts among the rocks on the side of a high hill close to the village the situation was almost impregnable being everywhere surrounded with high precipices except on the eastern side where the natives had left a pathway sufficient to allow one person at a time to ascend upon the brow of the hill immediately over this path i observed several heaps of large loose stones which the people told me were intended to be thrown down upon the fulas if they should attempt the hill at daybreak on the twenty third we departed from this village and entered the jalonka wilderness we passed in the course of the morning the ruins of two small towns which had lately been burnt by the fulas the fire must have been very intense for i observed that the walls of many of the huts were slightly vitrified and appeared at a distance as if covered with a red varnish about ten o'clock we came to the river wanda which is somewhat larger than the river kokoru but the stream was at this the rather muddy which karfa assured me was occasioned by amazing shoals of fish they were indeed seen in all directions and in such abundance that i fancied the water itself tasted and smelt fishy as soon as we had crossed the river karfa gave orders that all the people of the coffle should in future keep close together and travel in their proper station the guides and young men were accordingly placed in the van the women and slaves in the centre and the freemen in the rear in this order we travelled with uncommon expedition through a woody but beautiful country interspersed with a pleasing variety of hill and dale and abundant with partridges guinea fowl and deer until sunset when we arrived at a most romantic stream called ko Masang. my arms and neck having been exposed to the sun during the whole day and irritated by the rubbing of my dress in walking were now very much inflamed and covered with blisters and i was happy to embrace the opportunity while the coffle rested on the bank of the river to bathe myself in the stream this practice together with the cool of the evening much diminished the inflammation about three miles to the westward of the Komasang, we halted in a thick wood and kindled our fires for the night we were all by this time very much fatigued having as i judged travelled this day thirty miles but no person was heard to complain whilst supper was preparing karfa made one of the slaves break some branches from the trees for my bed when we had finished our supper of couscous moistened with some boiling water and put the slaves in irons we all lay down to sleep but we were frequently disturbed in the night by the howling of wild beasts and we found the small brown ants very troublesome april twenty fourth before daybreak the bushreens said their morning prayers and most of the free people drank a little moinging a sort of gruel part of which was likewise given to such of the slaves as appeared least able to sustain the fatigues of the day 
one of Carfa's female slaves was very sulky, and when some gruel was offered to her, she refused to drink it. As soon as day dawned, we set out, and travelled the whole morning over a wild and rocky country, by which my feet were much bruised, and I was sadly apprehensive that I should not be able to keep up with a coffle during the day but i was in a great measure relieved from this anxiety when i observed that others were more exhausted than myself in particular the woman slave who had refused victuals in the morning began now to lag behind and complain dreadfully of pains in her legs her load was taken from her and given to another slave and she was ordered to keep in the front of the coffle about eleven o'clock as we were resting by a small rivulet some of the people discovered a hive of bees in a hollow tree and they were proceeding to obtain the honey when the largest swarm i have ever beheld flew out and attacking the people of the coffle made us fly in all directions i took the alarm first and i believe was the only person who escaped with impunity when our enemies thought fit to desist from pursuing us and every person was employed in picking out the stings he had received it was discovered that the poor woman above mentioned whose name was neely was not come up and as many of the slaves in their retreat had left their brindles behind them it became necessary for some persons to return and bring them in order to do this with safety fire was set to the grass a considerable way to the eastward of the hive and the wind driving the fire furiously along the party pushed through the smoke and recovered the bundles they likewise brought with them poor neely whom they found lying by the rivulet she was very much exhausted and had crept to the stream in hopes to defend herself from the bees by throwing water over her body but this proved ineffectual for she was stung in the most dreadful manner when the slatees had picked out the stings as far as they could she was washed with water and then rubbed with bruised leaves but the wretched woman obstinately refused to proceed any farther declaring that she would rather die than walk another step as entreaties and threats were used in vain the whip was at length applied and after bearing patiently a few strokes she started up and walked with tolerable exhibition for four or five hours longer when she made an attempt to run away from the coffle but was so very weak that she fell down in the grass though she was unable to rise the whip was a second time applied but without effect upon which carfa desired two of the slatees to place her upon the ass which carried our dry provisions but she could not sit erect and the ass being very refractory it was found impossible to carry her forward in this manner the slatees however were unwilling to abandon her the day's jury being nearly ended and therefore made a sort of litter of bamboo canes upon which she was placed and tied on it with slips of bark this litter was carried upon the heads of two slaves one walking before the other and they were followed by two others who relieved them occasionally in this manner the woman was carried forward until it was dark when we reached a stream of water at the foot of a high hill called gang karin kuru and here we stopped for the night and set about preparing our supper as we had only ate one handful of meal since the preceding night and travelled all day in a hot sun many of the slaves who had loads upon their heads were very much fatigued and some of them snapped their
their fingers which among the negroes is a sure sign of desperation the slatties immediately put them all in irons and such of them had evinced signs of great despondency were kept apart from the rest and had their hands tied in the morning they were found greatly recovered april twenty fifth at daybreak poor neelie was awakened but her limbs were now become so stiff and painful that she could neither walk nor stand she was therefore lifted like a corpse upon the back of an ass and the slatties endeavoured to secure her in that situation by fastening her hands together under the ass's neck and her feet under the belly with long slips of bark but the ass was so very unruly that no sort of treatment could induce him to proceed with his load and as neelie made no exertion to prevent herself from falling she was quickly thrown off and had one of her legs much bruised every attempt to carry her forward being thus found ineffectual the general cry of the coffle was kang tigri kang tigri cut her throat cut her throat an operation i did not wish to see performed and therefore marched onwards with the foremost of the coffle i had not walked about a mile when one of carfle's domestic slaves came up to me with poor neela's garment upon the end of his bow and exclaimed neely afelita neely is lost i asked him whether the slatties had given him the garment as a reward for cutting her throat he replied that carfa and the schoolmaster would not consent to the measure but had left her on the road where undoubtedly she soon perished and was probably devoured by wild beasts the sad fate of this wretched woman notwithstanding the outcry before mentioned made a strong impression on the mind of the whole coffle and the schoolmaster fasted the whole of the ensuing day in a consequence of it we proceeded in deep silence and soon afterwards crossed the river fukoma which was about as large as the river wanda we now travelled with great expedition every one being apprehensive he might otherwise meet with the fate of poor neely it was however with great difficulty that i could keep up although i threw away my spear and everything that could in the la least obstruct me about noon we saw a large herd of elephants but they suffered us to pass unmolested and in the evening we halted near a thicket of bamboo but found no water so that we were forced to proceed four miles farther to a small stream where we stopped for the night we had marched this day as i judged about twenty-six miles april twenty sixth this morning two of the schoolmaster's pupils complained much of pains in their legs and one of the slaves walked lame the soles of his feet being very much blistered and inflamed we proceeded notwithstanding and about eleven o'clock began to ascend a rocky hill called boki koru and it was past two in the afternoon before we reached the level ground on the other side this was the most rocky road we had yet encountered and it hurt our feet much in a short time we arrived at a pretty large river called boki which we forded it ran smooth and clear over a bed of windstone about a mile to the westward of the river we came to a road which leads to the northeast towards gadu and seeing the marks of many horses feet upon the soft sand the slatties conjectured that a party of plunderers had lately rode that way to fall upon some town of gadu and lest they should discover upon their return 
that we had passed and attempt to pursue us by the marks of our feet the coffle was ordered to disperse and travel in a loose manner through the high grass and bushes a little before it was dark having crossed the ridge of hills to the westward of the river boki we came to a well called kolong ki white sand well and here we rested for the night april twenty seventh we departed from the well early in the morning and walked on with greatest alacrity in hopes of reaching a town before night the road during the forenoon led through extensive thickets of dry bamboos about two o'clock we came to a stream called nankolo where we were each of us regaled with a handful of a meal which according to a superstitious custom was not to be eaten until it was first moistened with water from this stream about four o'clock we reached susita a small jalonka village situated in the district of kulo which comprehends all that tract of country lying along the banks of the black river or main branch of the senegal these were the first human habitations we had seen since we left the village to the westward of kinitakuru having travelled in the course of the last five days upwards of one hundred miles here after a great deal of entreaty we were provided with huts to sleep in but the master of the village plainly told us that he could not give us any provisions as there had lately been a great scarcity in this part of the country he assured us that before they had gathered in their present crops the whole inhabitants of kulo had been for twenty-nine days without tasting corn during which time they supported themselves entirely upon the yellow powder which is found in the pods of the nita so called by the natives a species of mimosa and upon the seeds of the bamboo cane which when properly pounded and dressed tastes very much like rice as our dry provisions were not yet exhausted a considerable quantity of couscous was dressed for supper and many of the villagers were invited to take part of the repast but they made a very bad return for this kindness for in the night they seized upon one of the schoolmaster's boys who had fallen asleep under the bentang tree and carried him away the boy fortunately awoke before he was far from the village and setting up a loud scream the man who carried him put his hand upon his mouth and ran with him into the woods but afterwards understanding that he belonged to the schoolmaster whose place of residence is only three days journey distant he thought i suppose that he could not retain him as a slave without the schoolmaster's knowledge and therefore stripped off the boy's clothes and permitted him to return april twenty eighth early in the morning we departed from susita and about ten o'clock came to an unwalled town called mana the inhabitants of which were employed in collecting the fruit of the nita trees which are very numerous in the neighborhood the pods are long and narrow and contain a few black seeds enveloped in the fine mealy powder before mentioned the meal itself is of a bright yellow color resembling the flower of sulphur and has a sweet mucilaginous taste when eaten by itself it is clammy but when mixed with milk or water it constitutes a very pleasant and nourishing article of diet the language of the people of mana is the same that is spoken all over that extensive and hilly country called jal and hilly country called 
jow on kadu some of the words have great affinity to the mandingo but the natives themselves consider it as a distinct language their numerals are these one kidding two fitting three sarah four nanny five sulo six seni seven sulo ma fitting eight sulo ma sara nine sula ma nanny ten nuff the jalonkas like the mandingos are governed by a number of petty chiefs who are in a great measure independent of each other they have no common sovereign and the chiefs are seldom upon such terms of friendship as to assist each other even in war time the chief of mana with a number of his people accompanied us to the banks of the baffing or black river a principal branch of the senegal which we crossed upon a bridge of bamboos of a very singular construction the river at this place is smooth and deep and has very little current two tall trees when tied together by the tops are sufficiently long to reach from one side to the other the roots resting upon the rocks and the tops floating in the water when a few trees have been placed in this direction they are covered with dry bamboos so as to form a floating bridge with a sloping gangway at each end where the trees rest upon the rocks this bridge is carried away every year by the swelling of the river in the rainy season and is constantly rebuilt by the inhabitants of mana who on that account expect a small tribute from every passenger in the afternoon we passed several villages at none of which we could procure lodging and in the twilight we received information that two hundred jalonkas had assembled near a town called milo with a view to plunder the coffle this induced us to alter our course and we travelled with great secrecy until midnight when we approached a town called koba before we entered the town the names of all the people belonging to the coffle were carried over and a freeman and three slaves were found to be missing every person immediately concluded that the slaves had murdered the freeman and made their escape it was therefore agreed that six people should go back as far as the last village and endeavor to find his body or collect some information concerning the slaves in the meantime the cough was ordered to lie concealed in a cotton field near a large nitta tree and nobody to speak except in whisper it was towards morning before the six men returned having heard nothing of the man or the slaves as none of us had tasted victuals for the last twenty-four hours it was agreed that we should go into koba and endeavor to procure some provisions we accordingly entered the town before it was quite day and karfa purchased from the chief man for three strings of beads a considerable quantity of ground nuts which we roasted and ate for breakfast we were afterwards provided with huts and rested here for the day about eleven o'clock to our great joy and surprise the freemen and slaves who had parted from the coffle the preceding night entered the town one of the slaves it seems had hurt his foot and the night being very dark they soon lost sight of the coffle the freeman as soon as he found himself alone with the slaves was aware of his own danger and insisted on putting them in irons the slaves were at first rather unwilling to submit but when he threatened to stab them one by one with his spear they made no farther resistance and he remained with them among the bushes until morning 
when he let them out of irons and came to town in hopes of hearing which route the coffle had taken the information that we received concerning the jalonkas who intended to rob the coffle was this day confirmed and we were forced to remain here until the afternoon of the thirtieth when carfa hired a number of people to protect us and we proceeded to a village called ting king tang departing this village on the day following we crossed a high ridge of mountains to the west of the black river and travelled over a rough stony country until sunset when we arrived at ling ikata a small village in the district of war adu here we shook out the last handful of meal from our dry provision bags this being the second day since we crossed the black river that we had travelled from morning until night without tasting one morsel of food may second we departed from ling ikata but the sleighs being very much fatigued we halted for the night at a village about nine miles to the westward and procured some provisions through the interest of the schoolmaster who now sent forward a messenger to malacotta his native town to inform his friends of his arrival in the country and to desire them to provide the necessary quantity of victuals to entertain the coffle for two or three days may third we set out for malacotta and about noon arrived at a village near a considerable stream of water which flows to the westward here we determined to stop for the return of the messenger who had been sent to malacotta the day before and as the natives assured me there were no crocodiles in the stream i went and bathed myself very few people here can swim for they came in numbers to dissuade me from venturing into a pool where they said the water would come over my head about two o'clock the messenger returned from malacotta and the schoolmaster's elder brother being impatient to see him came along with the messenger to meet him at this village the interview between the two brothers who had not seen each other for nine years was very natural and affecting they fell upon each other's neck and it was some time before either of them could speak at length when the schoolmaster had a little recovered himself he took his brother by the hand and turning round this is the man said he pointing to carfa who has been my father in manding i would have pointed him out sooner to you but my heart was too full we reached malacotta in the evening where we all were well received this is an unwalled town the huts for the most part are made of split cane twisted into a sort of wicker walk and plastered over with mud here we remained three days and were each day presented with a bullock from the schoolmaster we were likewise well entertained by the townspeople who appear to be very active and industrious they make very good soap by boiling ground nuts in water and then adding a lay of wood ashes they likewise manufacture excellent iron which they carry to bondu to barter for salt a party of the townspeople had lately returned from a trading expedition of this kind and brought information concerning a war between alamami abdul Qadar, king of futatora and damel king of the jalofs the events of this war soon became a favorite subject with the singing men and the common topic of conversation in all the kingdoms bordering upon the senegal and gambia and as the account is somewhat singular i shall here abridge it for the reader's information the king of futa tora 
inflamed with a zeal for propagating his religion has sent an embassy to damo similar to that which he had sent to Kasson, as has been previously related the ambassador on the present occasion was accompanied by two of the principal bushreens who carried each a large knife fixed on the top of a long pole as soon as he had procured admission into the presence of damo and announced the pleasure of his sovereign he ordered the bushreens to present the emblems of his mission the two knives were accordingly laid before damo and the ambassador explained himself as follows with this knife said he abdul kadar will condescend to shave the head of damo if damo will embrace the mohammedan faith and with this other knife abdul kadar will cut the throat of damo if damo refuses to embrace it take your choice damo coolly told the ambassador that he had no choice to make he neither chose to have his head shaved nor his throat cut and with this answer the ambassador was civilly dismissed abdul kadar took his measures accordingly and with a powerful army invaded damo's country the inhabitants of the towns and village filled up their wells destroyed their provisions carried off their effects and abandoned their dwellings as he approached by this means he was led on from place to place until he had advanced three days journey into the country of the jalofs he had indeed met with no opposition but his army had suffered so much from the scarcity of water that several of his men had died by the way this induced him to direct his march towards a watering place in the woods where his men having quenched their thirst and being overcome with fatigue lay down carelessly to sleep among the bushes in this situation they were attacked by damo before daybreak and completely routed many of them were trampled to death as they lay asleep by the jalof horses others were killed in attempting to make their escape and a still greater number were taken prisoners among the latter was abdul kadar himself this ambitious or rather frantic prince who but a month before had sent the threatening message to damo was now himself led into his presence as a miserable captive the behavior of damo on this occasion is never mentioned by the singing men but in terms of the highest approbation and it was indeed so extraordinary in an african prince that the reader may find it difficult to give credit to the recital when his royal prisoner was brought before him in irons and thrown upon the ground the magnanimous damo instead of setting his foot upon his neck and stabbing him with his spear according to custom in such cases addressed him as follows abdul kadar answer me this question if the chance of war had placed me in your situation and you in mine how would you have treated me i would have thrust my spear into your heart returned abdul kadar with great firmness and i know that a similar fate awaits me not so said damo my spear is indeed red with the blood of your subjects killed in battle and i could now give it a deeper stain by dipping it in your own but this would not build up my towns nor bring to life the thousands who fell in the woods i will not therefore kill you in cold blood but i will retain you as my slave until i perceive that your presence in your own kingdom will be no longer dangerous to your neighbors 
and then I will consider of the proper way of disposing of you. Abdul Kadar was accordingly retained, and worked as a slave for three months, at the end of which period Damo listened to the solicitations of the inhabitants of Futa Torah, and restored to them their king. Strange as this story may appear, I have no doubt of the truth of it. It was told me at Malakata by the Negroes. It was afterwards related to me by the Europeans on the Gambia, by some of the French at Goree, and confirmed by nine slaves who were taken prisoners along with Abdul Kadar, by the watering place in the woods, and carried in the same ship with me to the West Indies. End of Volume 2, Chapter 25 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 2, Chapter 26 Of the Travels in the Interior of Africa by Mungo Park This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Meeting with Dr. Laidley return to the coast voyage to england on the seventh of may we departed from malacotta and having crossed the bali honey river a branch of the senegal we arrived in the evening at a walled town called bintingala where we rested two days from thence in one day more we proceeded to din iku a small town situated at the bottom of a high ridge of hills from which this district is named kon kodu the country of mountains these hills are very productive of gold i was shown a small quantity of this metal which had been lately collected the grains were about the usual size but much flatter than those of manding and were found in white quartz which had been broken to pieces by hammers at this town i met with a negro whose hair and skin were of a dull white color he was of that sort which are called in the spanish west indies albinos or white negroes the skin is cadaverous and unsightly and the natives considered this complexion i believe truly as the effect of disease may eleventh at daybreak we departed from din i Kiku, and after a toilsome day travel arrived in the evening at satadu the capital of a district of the same name this town was formerly of considerable extent but many families had left it in consequence of the predatory incursions of the fulas of fula jala who made it a practice to come secretly through the woods and carry off people from the cornfields and even from the wells near the town in the afternoon of the twelfth we crossed the falami river the same which i had formerly crossed at bondu in my journey eastward this river at the season of the year is easily forded at this place the stream being only about two feet deep the water is very pure and flows rapidly over a bed of sand and gravel we launched for the night at a small village called mendina the sole property of a mandingo merchant who by a long intercourse with europeans has been induced to adopt some of their customs his victuals were served up in pewter dishes and even his houses were built after the fashion of the english houses on the gambia may thirteenth in the morning as we were preparing to depart a coffle of slaves belonging to some sarawoolly traders crossed the river and agreed to proceed with us to bain sur lee the capital of dentilla a very long day's journey from this place we accordingly set out together and traveled with great expedition through the woods until noon 
when one of the sarah woolly slaves dropped the load from his head for which he was smartly whipped the load was replaced but he had not proceeded above a mile before he let it fall a second time for which he received the same punishment after this he travelled in great pain until about two o'clock when we stopped to breathe a little by a pool of water the day being remarkably hot the poor slave was now so completely exhausted that his master was obliged to release him from the rope for he lay motionless on the ground a sarah woolly therefore undertook to remain with him and endeavor to bring him to the town during the cool of the night in the meanwhile we continued our route and after a very hard stay travel arrived at ban Surly late in the evening one of our slatties was a native of this place from which he had been absent three years this man invited me to go with him to his house at the gate of which his friends met him with many expressions of joy shaking hands with him embracing him and singing and dancing before him as soon as he had seated himself upon a mat by the threshold of his door a young woman his intended bride brought a little water in a calabash and kneeling down before him desired him to wash his hands when he had done this the girl with a tear of joy sparkling in her eyes drank the water this being considered as the greatest proof she could possibly give him of her fidelity and attachment about eight o'clock the same evening the sarah woolly who had been left in the woods to take care of the fatigued slave returned and told us that he was dead the general opinion however was that he himself had killed him or left him to perish on the road for the sarah woolies are said to be infinitely more cruel in their treatment of slaves than the mandingos we remained at bay Cerely two days in order to purchase native iron shea butter and some other articles for sale on the gambia and here the slattee who had invited me to his house and who possessed three slaves part of the coffle had obtained information that the price on the coast was very low determined to separate from us and remain with his slaves where he was until an opportunity should offer of disposing of them to advantage giving us to understand that he should complete his nuptials with the young woman before mentioned in the meantime may sixteenth we departed from basarily and travelled through the thick woods until noon when we saw at a distance the town of julifunda but did not approach it as we proposed to rest for the night at a large town called kirwani which we reached about four o'clock in the afternoon this town stands in a valley and the country for more than a mile around it is cleared of wood and well cultivated the inhabitants appear to be very active and industrious and seem to have carried the system of agriculture to some degree of perfection for they collect the dung of their cattle into large heaps during the dry season for the purpose of manuring their land with it at the proper time i saw nothing like this in any other part of africa near the town are several smelting furnaces from which the natives obtain very good iron they afterwards hammer the metal into small bars about a foot in length and two inches in breadth one of which bars is sufficient to make two mandingo corn hoes on the morning after our arrival we were visited by a slattee of this place who informed Carfa that among some slaves he had lately purchased was a native of futa jala and as that country was no great distance 
he could not safely employ him in the labors of the field lest he should effect his escape the slattee was therefore desirous of exchanging this slave for one of karfa's and offered some cloth and shea butter to induce karfa to comply with the proposal which was accepted the slattee thereupon sent a boy to order the slave in question to bring him a few ground nuts the poor creature soon afterwards entered the court in which we were sitting having no suspicion of what was negotiating until the master caused the gate to be shut and told him to sit down the slave now saw his danger and perceiving the gate to be shut upon him threw down the nuts and jumped over the fence he was immediately pursued and overtaken by the slattees who brought him back and secured him in irons after which one of karfa's slaves was released and delivered in exchange the unfortunate captive was at first very much dejected but in the course of a few days his melancholy gradually subsided and he became at length as cheerful as any of his companions departing from kirwani on the morning of the twentieth we entered the tenda wilderness of two days journey the woods were very thick and the country shelved towards the southwest about ten o'clock we met a coffle of twenty-six people and seven loaded asses returning from the gambia most of the men were armed with muskets and had broad belts of scarlet cloth over their shoulders and european hats upon their heads they informed us that there was very little demand for slaves on the coast and no vessel had arrived for some months past on hearing this the sarawoolies who had travelled with us from the falme river separated themselves and their slaves from the coffle they had not they said the means of maintaining their slaves in gambia until a vessel should arrive and were unwilling to sell them to disadvantage they therefore departed to the northward for kaja we continued our route through the wilderness and travelled all day through a rugged country covered with extensive thickets of bamboo at sunset to our great joy we arrived at a pool of water near a large taba tree whence the place is called tabagi and here we rested a few hours the water at this season of the year is by no means plentiful in these woods and as the days were unsufferably hot karfa proposed to travel in the night accordingly about eleven o'clock the slaves were taken out of their irons and the people of the coffle received orders to keep close together as well to prevent the slaves from attempting to escape as on account of the wild beasts we travelled with great alacrity until daybreak when it was discovered that a free woman had parted from the coffle in the night her name was called until the woods resounded but no answer being given we conjectured that she had either mistaken the road or that a lion had seized her unperceived at length it was agreed that four people should go back a few miles to a small rivulet where some of the coffle had stopped to drink as we passed in the night and that the coffle should wait for their return the sun was about an hour high before the people came back with the woman who they found lying fast asleep by the stream we now resumed our journey and about eleven o'clock reached a walled town called tambacunda where we were well received here we remained four days on account of a palaver which was held on the following occasion moda lemina one of the slatties belonging to the coffle had formerly married a woman of this town who had borne him two children he afterwards went to manding 
and remained there eight years without sending any account of himself during all that time to his deserted wife who seeing no prospect of his return at the end of three years had married another man to whom she had likewise borne two children lamina now claimed his wife but the second husband refused to deliver her up insisting that by the laws of africa when a man had been three years absent from his wife without giving her notice of his being alive the woman is at liberty to marry again after all the circumstances had been fully investigated in an assembly of the chief men it was determined that the wife should make her choice and be at liberty either to return to the first husband or continue with the second as she alone should think proper favorable as this determination was to the lady she found it a difficult matter to make up her mind and requested time for consideration but i think i could perceive that first love would carry the day lamima was indeed somewhat older than his rival but he was also much richer what weight the circumstance had in the scale of his wife's affections i pretend not to say on the morning of the twenty sixth we departed from tambacunda Carfa observed to me that there was no shade trees farther to the westward than this town i had collected and brought with me from manding the leaves and flowers of this tree but they were so greatly bruised on the road that i had thought it best to gather another specimen at this place the appearance of the fruit evidently places the shade tree in the natural order of sapoti and it has some resemblance to the madhuka tree described by lieutenant charles hamilton in the asiatic researches volume one page three hundred about one o'clock on the morning of the twenty sixth we reached sibi killen a walled village but the inhabitants having the character of inhospitality towards strangers and of being much addicted to theft we did not think proper to enter the gate we rested a short time under a tree and then continued our route until it was dark when we halted for the night by a small stream running towards the gambia next day the road led over a wild and rocky country everywhere rising into hills and abounding with monkeys and wild beasts in the rivulets among the hills we found great plenty of fish this was a very hard day's journey and it was not until sunset that we reached the village of kumbu near to which are the ruins of a large town formerly destroyed by war the inhabitants of kumbu like those of sibi killen have so bad a reputation that strangers seldom lodge in the village we accordingly rested for the night in the fields where we erected temporary huts for our protection there being great appearance of rain may twenty eighth we departed from kumbu and slept at a fula town about seven miles to the westward from which on the day following having crossed a considerable branch of the gambia called nilocopa we reached a well inhabited part of the country here are several towns within sight of each other collectively called tenda but each is distinguished also by its particular name we lodged at one of them called koba tenda where we remained the day following in order to procure provisions for our support in crossing the simbani woods on the thirtieth we reached jalakota a considerable town but much infested by fula bandati who come through the woods from bondu and steal everything they can lay their hands on a few days before our arrival 
they had stolen twenty head of cattle and on the day following made a second attempt but were beaten off and one of them was taken prisoner here one of the slaves belonging to the coffle who had travelled with great difficulty for the last three days was found unable to proceed any farther his master a singing man proposed therefore to exchange him for a young slave girl belonging to one of the town's people the poor girl was ignorant of her fate until the bundles were all tied up in the morning and the coffle ready to depart when coming with some other young women to see the coffle set out her master took her by the hand and delivered her to the singing man never was a face of serenity more suddenly changed into one of the deepest distress the terror she manifested on having the load put upon her head and the rope fastened round her neck and the sorrow with which she bade adieu to her companions were truly affecting about nine o'clock we crossed a large plain covered with siboa trees a species of palm and came to the river near eco a branch of the gambia this was but a small river at this time but in the rainy season it is often dangerous to travellers as soon as we had crossed this river the singing man began to vociferate a particular song expressive of their joy at having got safe into the west country or as they expressed it the land of the setting sun the country was found to be very level and the soil a mixture of clay and sand in the afternoon it rained hard and we had recourse to the common negro umbrella a large cibola leaf which being placed upon the head completely defends the whole body from the rain we lodged for the night under the shade of a large taba tree near the ruins of a village on the morning following we crossed a stream called nuliko and about two o'clock to my infinite joy i saw myself once more on the banks of the gambia which at this place being deep and smooth is navigable but the people told me that a little lower down the stream is so shallow that the coffles frequently cross it on foot june second we departed from c secunda and passed a number of villages at none of which was the coffle permitted to stop although we were all very much fatigued it was four o'clock in the afternoon before we reached baraconda where we rested one day departing from baraconda on the morning of the fourth we reached in a few hours medina the capital of the king of woolly's dominions from whom the reader may recollect i received a hospitable reception in the beginning of december seventeen ninety five in my journey eastward i immediately inquired concerning the health of my good old benefactor and learned with great concern that he was dangerously ill as carfa would not allow the coffle to stop i could not present my respects to the king in person but i sent him word by the officer to whom we paid customs that his prayers for my safety had not been unfailing we continued our route until sunset when we lodged at a small village a little to the westward of kutakunda and on the day following arrived at jindi where eighteen months before i had parted from my friend dr Laidley an interval during which i had not beheld the face of a christian nor once heard the delightful sound of my native language being now arrived within a short distance of pisania from whence my journey originally commenced and learning that my friend carfa was not likely to meet with an immediate opportunity of selling his slaves on the gambia 
it occurred to me to suggest to him that he would find it for his interest to leave them at jindai until a market should offer karfa agreed with me in this opinion and hired from the chief man of the town huts for their accommodation and a piece of land on which to employ them in raising corn and other provisions for their maintenance with regard to himself he declared that he would not quit me until my departure from africa we set out accordingly karfa myself and one of the fulas belonging to the coffle early on the morning of the ninth but although i was now approaching the end of my tedious and toilsome journey and expected in another day to meet with countrymen and friends i could not part for the last time with my unfortunate fellow-travellers doomed as i know most of them to be to a life of captivity and slavery in a foreign land without great emotion during a wearisome peregrination of more than five hundred british miles exposed to the burning rays of a tropical sun these poor slaves amidst their own infinitely greater sufferings would commiserate mine and frequently of their own accord bring water to quench my thirst and at night collect branches and leaves to prepare me a bed in the wilderness we parted with reciprocal expressions of regret and benediction my good wishes and prayers were all i could bestow upon them and it afforded me some consolation to be told that they were sensible i had no more to give my anxiety to get forward admitting of no delay on the road we reached ten dakunda in the evening and were hospitably received at the house of an aged black female called senoria camilla a person who resided many years at the english factory and spoke our language i was known to her before i had left the gambia at the outset of my journey but my dress and figure were now so different from the usual appearance of a european she was very excusable in mistaking me for a moor when i told her my name and country she surveyed me with great astonishment and seemed unwilling to give credit to the testimony of her senses she assured me that none of the traders on the gambia ever expected to see me again having been informed long ago that the moors of ludamar had murdered me as they had murdered major houghton i inquired for my two attendants johnson and demba and learned with great sorrow that neither of them was returned karfa who had never before heard people converse in english listened to us with great attention everything he saw seemed wonderful the furniture of the house the chairs etc and particularly beds with curtains were objects of his great admiration and he asked me a thousand questions concerning the utility and necessity of different articles to some of which i found it difficult to give satisfactory answers on the morning of the tenth mr robert ainsley having learned that i was at tendakunda came to meet me and politely offered me the use of his horse he informed me that dr laidley had removed all his property to a place called kai a little farther down the river and that he was then gone to doom asana with his vessel to purchase rice but would return in a day or two he therefore invited me to stay with him at pisania until the doctor's return i accepted the invitation and being accompanied by my friend karfa reached pisania about ten o'clock mr ainsley's schooner was lying at anchor before the place this was the most surprising object which karfa had yet seen 
he could not easily comprehend the use of the masts sails and rigging nor did he conceive that it was possible by any sort of contrivance to make so large a body move forwards by the common force of the wind the manner of fastening together the different planks which composed the vessel and filling up the seams as so to exclude the water was perfectly new to him and i found that the schooner with her cable and anchor kept carfa in deep meditation the greater part of the day about noon on the twelfth dr laidley returned from dumasana and received me with great joy and satisfaction as one risen from the dead finding that the wearing apparel which i had left under his care was not sold or sent to england i lost no time in resuming the english dress and disrobing my chin of its venerable encumbrance carfa surveyed me in my british apparel with great delight but regretted exceedingly that i had taken off my beard the loss of which he said had converted me from a man into a boy dr laidley readily undertook to discharge all the pecuniary engagements which i had entered into since my departure from the gambia and took my draft upon the association for the amount my agreement with carfa as i have already related was to pay him the value of one prime slave for which i had given him my bill upon dr laidley before we departed from camellia for in case of my death on the road i was unwilling that my benefactor should be a loser but in this good creature had continued to manifest towards me so much kindness that i thought i made him but an inadequate recompense when i told him that i was now to receive double the sum i had originally promised and dr laidley assured him that he was ready to deliver the goods to that amount whenever he thought proper to send for them carfa was overpowered by this unexpected token of my gratitude and still more so when he heard that i intended to send a handsome present to the good old schoolmaster fan kuma at malacotta he promised to carry up the goods along with his own and dr laidley assured him that he would exert himself in assisting him to dispose of his slaves to the best advantage the moment a slave vessel should arrive these and other instances of attention and kindness shown him by dr laidley were not lost upon carfa he would often say to me my journey has indeed been prosperous but observing the improved state of our manufactures and our manifest superiority in the arts of civilized life he would sometimes appear pensive and exclaim with an involuntary sigh fado thing inta thing black men are nothing at other times he would ask me with great seriousness what could possibly have induced me who was no trader to think of exploring so miserable a country as africa he meant by this to signify that after what i must have witnessed in my own country nothing in africa could in his opinion deserve a moment's attention i have preserved these little traits of character in this worthy negro not only from regard to the man but also because they appear to me to demonstrate that he possessed a mind above his condition and to such of my readers as love to contemplate human nature in all varieties and to trace its progress from rudeness to refinement i hope the account i have given of this poor african will not be unacceptable 
No European vessel had arrived at Gambia for many months previous to my return from the interior, and as the rainy season was now setting in, I persuaded Carfa to return to his people at Jindi. He parted with me on the 14th with great tenderness, but as I had little hopes of being able to quit Africa for the remainder of the year, I told him, as the fact was, that I expected to see him again before my departure. In this, however, I was luckily disappointed, and my narrative now hastens to its conclusion. For on the 15th, the ship Charleston, an American vessel commanded by Mr. Charles Harris, entered the river. She came for slaves intending to touch at goree to fill up and to proceed from thence to south carolina as the european merchants on the gambia had at this time a great many slaves on hand they agreed with the captain to purchase the whole of his cargo consisting chiefly of rum and tobacco and deliver him slaves to the amount in the course of two days this afforded me such an opportunity of returning though by a circuitous route to my native country as i thought was not to be neglected i therefore immediately engaged my passage in this vessel for america and having taken leave of dr Laidley, to whose kindness i was so largely indebted and my other friends on the river I embarked at Kei on the 17th day of June. Our passage down the river was tedious and fatiguing, and the weather was so hot, moist, and unhealthy, that before our arrival at Goree, four of the seamen, the surgeon, and three of the slaves had died of fevers. At Goree we were detained, for want of provisions, until the beginning of October the number of slaves received on board this vessel both on the gambia and at goree was one hundred and thirty of whom about twenty-five had been i suppose a free condition in africa as most of these being bushreens could write a little arabic nine of them had become captives in the religious war between abu Qadar and tamel mentioned in the latter part of the preceding chapter two of the others had seen me as i passed through bondu and many of them had heard of me in the interior countries my conversation with them in their native language gave them great comfort and as the surgeon was dead i consented to act in a medical capacity in his room for the remainder of the voyage they had in truth need of every consolation in my power to bestow not that i observed any wanton acts of cruelty practised either by the master or the seamen towards them but the mode of confining and securing negroes in the american slave ships owing chiefly to the weakness of their crews being abundantly more rigid and severe than in british vessels employed in the same traffic made these poor creatures to suffer greatly and a general sickness prevailed amongst them besides the three who died on the gambia and six or eight while we remained at goree eleven perished at sea and many of the survivors were reduced to a very weak and emaciated condition in the midst of these distresses the vessel after having been three weeks at sea became so extremely leaky as to require constant exertion at the pumps it was found necessary therefore to take some of the ablest of the negro men out of irons and employ them in this labor in which they were often worked beyond their strength this produced a complication of miseries not easily to be described we were however relieved much sooner than i expected for the leak continuing to gain upon us 
notwithstanding our utmost exertions to clear the vessel the seamen insisted on bearing away for the west indies as affording the only chance of saving our lives accordingly after some objections on the part of the master we directed our course for antigua and fortunately made that island in about thirty-five days after our departure from goree yet even at this juncture we narrowly escaped destruction for on approaching the northwest side of the island we struck on the diamond rock and got into st john's harbor with great difficulty the vessel was afterwards condemned as unfit for sea and the slaves as i have heard were ordered to be sold for the benefit of the owners at this island i remained ten days when the chesterfield packet homeward bound from the leeward islands touching at st john's for the antigua mail i took my passage in that vessel we sailed on the twenty fourth of november and after a short but tempestuous voyage arrived at falmouth on the twenty second of december from whence i immediately set out for london having been absent from england two years and seven months end of volume two chapter twenty six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume two note of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park this librivox recording is in the public domain note the following passage from james montgomery's poem the west indies published in eighteen ten was inspired by mungo park's travels in the interior of africa it enshrines in english verse the beautiful incident of the negro woman's song of charity on page one hundred and ninety of the first of these two volumes and closes with the poet's blessing upon mungo park himself who had sailed five years before upon the second journey from which he had not returned and whose fate did not become known until five years later man through all ages of revolving time unchanging man in every varying clime deems his own land of every land the pride beloved by heaven or all the world beside his home the spot of earth supremely blest a dearer sweeter spot than all the rest and is the negro outlawed from his birth is he alone a stranger on the earth is there no shed whose peeping roof appears so lovely that it fills his eyes with tears no land whose name in exile heard will dart ice through its veins and lightning through his heart ah yes beneath the beams of brighter skies his home amidst his father's country lies there with the partner of his soul he shares love mingled pleasures love divided cares there as with nature's warmest filial fire he soothes his blind and feeds his helpless sire his children sporting round his hut behold how they shall cherish him when he is old trained by example from their tenderest youth to deeds of charity and words of truth is he not blessed behold at closing day the negro village swarms abroad to play he treads the dance through all its rapturous rounds to the wild music of barbarian sounds or stretched at ease where broad palmettos shower delicious coolness in his shadowy bower he feasts on tales of witchcraft that give birth to breathless wonder or ecstatic mirth yet most delighted when in rudest rhymes the minstrel wakes the song of elder times when men were heroes 
slaves to beauty's charms and all the joys of life were love and arms is not the negroes blessed his generous soil with harvest plenty crowns his simple toil more than his wants his flocks and fields afford he loves to greet a stranger at his board the winds were roaring and the white man fled the rains of night descended on his head the poor white man sat down beneath our tree weary and faint and far from home was he for him no mother fills with milk the bowl no wife prepares the bread to cheer his soul pity the poor white man who sought our tree no wife no mother and no home has he thus sang the negro's daughters once again oh that poor white man might hear that strain whether the victim of the treacherous moor or from the negro's hospitable door spurned as a spy from europe's hateful clime and left to perish for thy country's crime or destined still when all thy wanderings cease on albion's lovely lap to rest in peace pilgrim in heaven or earth where'er thou be angels of mercy guide and comfort thee a note to the same poem gives the following record of facts substantiated in a court of justice in which there can be only one answer to the question which were the savages in this year seventeen eighty three certain underwriters desired to be heard against gregson and others of liverpool in the case of ship zong captain collingwood alleging that the captain on officers of the said vessel threw overboard one hundred and thirty-two slaves alive into the sea in order to defraud them by claiming the value of the said slaves as if they had been lost in a natural way in the course of the trial which afterwards came on it appeared that the slaves on board the zong were very sickly that sixty of them had already died and several were ill and likely to die when the captain proposed to james kessel the mate and others to throw several of them overboard stating that if they died a natural death the loss would fall upon the owners of the ship but that if they were thrown into the sea it would fall upon the underwriters he selected accordingly one hundred and thirty-two of the most sickly of the slaves fifty-four of these were immediately thrown overboard and forty-two were made to be partakers of their fate on the succeeding day in the course of three days afterwards the remaining twenty-six were brought upon deck to complete the number of victims the first sixteen submitted to be thrown into the sea but the rest with noble resolution would not suffer the offices to touch them but leapt after their companions and shared their fate the plea which was set up in behalf of this atrocious and unparalleled act of wickedness was that the captain discovered when he made the proposal that he had only two hundred gallons of water on board and that he had missed his port it was proved however in answer to this that no one had been put upon short allowance and that as if providence had determined to afford an unequivocal proof of the guilt a shower of rain fell and continued for three days immediately after the second lot of slaves had been destroyed by means of which they might have filled many of their vessels with water and thus have prevented all necessity for the destruction of the third mr granville sharp who after many years of struggle first obtained the decision of a court of justice that there are no slaves in england was present at this trial and procured the attendance of a shorthand writer 
to take down the facts which should come out in the course of it these he gave to the public afterwards he communicated them also with a copy of the trial to the lords of the admiralty as the guardians of justice upon the seas and to the duke of portland as principal minister of state no notice however was taken by any of these of the information which has been thus sent to them another incident of the middle passage suggested that james montgomery a poem called the voyage of the blind it was that fatal and perfidious bark built in the eclipse and rigged with curses dark milton's lycidius the ship le rodure captain b of two hundred tons burthen left haver on the twenty fourth of january eighteen nineteen for the coast of africa and reached her destination on the fourteenth of march following anchoring at bonny on the river calabar the crew consisting of twenty-two men enjoyed good health during the outward voyage and during their stay at bonny where they continued till the sixth of april they had observed no trace of ophthalmia among the natives and it was not until fifteen days after they had set sail on the return voyage and the vessel was near the equator that they perceived the first symptoms of this frightful malady it was then remarked that the negroes who to the number of one sixty were crowded together in the hold and between the decks had contracted a considerable redness of the eyes was spread with singular rapidity no great attention was at first paid to these symptoms which were thought to be caused only by the want of air in the hold and by the scarcity of water which had already begun to be felt at this time they were limited to eight ounces of water a day for each person which quantity was afterwards reduced to the half of a wine glass by the advice of m magnum the surgeon of the ship the negroes who had hitherto remained shut up in the hold were brought upon deck in succession in order that they might breathe a purer air but it became necessary to abandon this expedient salutary as it was because many of the negroes affected with nostalgia a passionate longing to return to their native land threw themselves into the sea locked in each other's arms the disease which had spread itself so rapidly and frightfully among the africans soon began to infect all on board the danger also was greatly increased by a malignant dysentery which prevailed at the time the first of the crew who caught it was a sailor who slept under the deck near the grated hatch which communicated with the hold the next day a landsman was seized with ophthalmia and in three days more the captain and the whole ship's company except one sailor who remained at the helm were blinded by the disorder all means of cure which the surgeon employed while he was able to act proved ineffectual the sufferings of the crew which were otherwise intense were aggravated by the apprehension of revolt among the negroes and the dread of not being able to reach the west indies if the only sailor who had hitherto escaped the contagion and on whom their whole hope rested should lose his sight like the rest this calamity had actually befallen the leon a spanish vessel which the rodure met on her passage and the whole of those crew having become blind were under the necessity of altogether abandoning the direction of their ship these unhappy creatures as they passed earnestly entreated the charitable interference of the seamen of the rodure but these under their own affliction could neither quit their vessel to go on board the leon nor receive the crew of the latter into the rodure 
where on account of the cargo of negroes there was scarcely room for themselves the vessels therefore soon parted company and the leon was never seen nor heard of again so far as could be traced at the publication of this narrative in all probability then it was lost on the fate of this vessel the poem is founded the rodure reached guadeloupe on the twenty first of june eighteen nineteen her crew being in a most deplorable condition of the negroes thirty-seven had become perfectly blind twelve had lost each an eye and fourteen remained otherwise blemished by the disease of the crew twelve including the surgeon had entirely lost their sight five escaped with an eye each and four were partially injured end of volume two note recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c end of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park